come to this panel on urban solutions and smart city development. I'm Fabian Zulik, I'm the chief executive and chief economist of the European Policy Center. Uh, we are a Brussels-based independent think tank. And it's my pleasure to moderate uh, this panel. Um, but uh, also I wanted to say that it's great to have this kind of conference in Budapest. It's been um, a while since uh, we've had these kind of discussions here. Um, so it's good to be back in Hungary and also to be back uh, in person. And I hope uh, this will become a permanent feature as was mentioned at the beginning of the conference. Um, so turning to the topic of this panel, um, it's rather broad, so it leaves us a lot of space to interpret. Um, but I wanted to start with making a link to what uh, the topic of the conference as a whole is, uh, building sustainable democracies. So what do urban solutions, smart cities have to do with sustainable democracy? Uh, for me, I see two str strong links. Um, I think uh, we are facing an tremendous amount of transformation. Uh, we have the digital transformation, the sustainability transformation, a transformation in global power, in politics, in demographics. Um, and these will change our, they are already changing our lives, but they will change our lives even more so in future. Um, so there will have to be responses when it comes to work, when it comes to leisure, when it comes to politics, uh, social life. And cities are very often uh, at the heart of these responses. But also these uh, tremendous changes will have an impact uh, which differs between different locations, between different groups in society. Uh, so the fairness of it, the way it affects different parts of the population will be a major uh, factor in its success or failure. Um, and again, cities will very often be crucial uh, in addressing this. So I think there are a lot of things we can talk about. Um, I think the city's dimension, the urban dimension is very important. Um, but it is also important to become a bit more concrete. Very often when we have these debates, particularly at the policy level, it's at a very abstract level. It's not about actually what do we do. Um, and I think this panel um, is particularly um, focused, at least um, to, to a great degree, on what is actually being done. Um, so I will be asking the panelists to also talk about how they see these big transformations, how they manage the transformation in their area, but also what difficulties um, you have encountered uh, in these transformations. So uh, without further ado, um, I will give every panelist a chance to make a short opening statement. Um, and I will start with Robert Brown, who is a senior researcher at the Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I first congratulate to the audience um, to be here at the final session. Um, um, Maybe as a final session, I want to start with a little reflection and um, in my opening, a reflection on what has been said and I, what I heard at this conference. And uh, there's two striking things. One, many have spoken about the never before seen crisis or crisis that we're experiencing. And what strikes me is that when I'm listening to most of the people, um, it's more the solutions business as usual, but better. And I think um, if there is a crisis never seen before, then probably our imagination should be a little bit more creative. And I want to start with actually the title, um, Urban Solutions in Smart City. I'm not a fan of neither solutionist approaches. It's pretty much engineering. Uh, I find a problem and I bring a solution and then that creates more problems. Um, and I'm also not very uh, fond of the idea of smart cities because usually not cities are smart but people. Uh, cities should be comfortable and healthy and uh, resilient. Um, smart is an idea selling technology um, to 
mainly bureaucrats who don't understand the technology. And there has been a lot of buzz created about smart cities. Um, so my kind of opening statement is that we first and foremost should radically reimagine mobility. And this radical reimagination re uh, should be returned to humane speed and take out violence, which is now the biggest characteristic of our cities. Cities are violent and they're created by cars, um, both pollution wise and accident wise. And I think one of the biggest challenges of cities will be how to get rid of them. And the second is radically reimagine placemaking. And this should be guided by uh, the debate of public versus private. And the reimagination should focus on making as much public space open to as many people as possible. So I don't know if that helps mayors and deputy mayors, but uh, I hope it does. But I'm a philosopher, so uh, don't expect very practical things from me. Thanks very much. Um, but I'll ask you a question immediately in, in um, follow-up. Where would you say uh, we have come closest to applying those kind of concepts you've been talking about? Or is this something which is very utopian, which we don't have seen anywhere? Oh, there, are a lot of, there, there has been a lot of experiments. Um, there are car-free cities, if you will. Um, there are um, places where uh, there is a lot of public space creation. Um, I don't think there is one example um, or one city to uh, claim. Barcelona is a good example, um, but there are other places. Um, I think it's not where has this been done, but rather um, are there people who are imaginative enough and brave enough um, to, to challenge existing norms, behaviors, and uh, the current imaginaries of um, the citizens, because I think that's one of the biggest problems. People can only imagine what they can imagine. Thanks very much. Um, so there's also a question to the other panelists, and how far is this something uh, which you are considering uh, in your day-to-day -day work? Um, but we'll stay um, a bit closer to home now. Um, I'll ask um, Janusz Konczani, sorry for my pronunciation, um, CEO of Graphisoft Park. Hello. Um, yeah. So thank you for the invitation. I would like I prepared a real uh, presentation how we connect to the uh, smart city uh, concept and how we do this job uh, in every day. So I would like to introduce Graphics of Park as a good illustrative case for the smart city project. Graphics of Park and Divos is published in 1982, far before the social changes. The software development company is one of the most successful startups in Hungary. The company has developed an architectural design software, which has been uh, the market leader ever since. By then, this, uh, by the mid 90s, the country music going company had outgrown its former offices and was looking for a new headquarters. Their idea was to develop a human scared working environment in which the offices are part of the nature set together an R&D community with many other companies and to integrate the education in business environment. After a careful, uh, careful search, our choice fell on the ground of abandoned Oberdegas work. Even in this broken down shape, the whole 19th century plant with the industrial monument buildings were impressive and attractive. On the top of that, the plot is directly on the Danube riverfront. We renovated the old monument buildings and we preserved them for the following generations. It was a typical brownfield investment. 
Maintaining the, uh, maintaining the balance between buildings and the natural environment was always an important consideration. We wanted to raise lower level new buildings than the old ones and lower than the trees in the park. We wanted to integrate the built environment to the beautiful Danube river front. Grafisot uh, Park is uh, the first and most important innovative hub in Hungary. It provides the headquarters for Grafisoft, Microsoft, SAP, and many other leading R&D companies. The park provides high quality working and studying environment for uh, 5,000 employees and 1,000 students. Sustainability is a, a guiding principle in the new developments. We use cutting edge technologi technologies by the new cost, uh, constructions to reduce the gas emission and the energy consumption. For us, an inspiring model is the Smart City Wien framework strategy. We are firmly confident that Budapest needs to have a similar strategy, and it is not just uh, up to the city hall who need to act. So we will be partner if they have such a plan. Our firm corporate based <laughs> our firm uh, operate based upon the principle of market economy with strong focus on CSR. We are proud of not asking and receiving any state subsidy or EU funds. Our project is in it all elements based on business feasibility. We want to demonstrate on that it is also possible to implement the ecological, ecological principles serving the sustainability goals in a profitable business. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, turning on the sustainability, which you just mentioned, and uh, we've got uh, one panelist joining us uh, online. Um, so I will ask uh, Diana Oege uh, who's the vice chair of working with three of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to come in. Uh, I hope the technology works and you can participate this way. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I apologize that I can't be there in person, but uh, I have two COVID positive kids at home and I decided not to risk uh, potentially uh, spreading the infection. And as a result, I apologize if there are background noises, but uh, the entire family is locked in <laughs> inside in home. So uh, we have um, we are sharing lots of us are sharing lots of space. So I would very much like to uh, applaud uh, the first speaker uh, because I uh, I fully agree with him that we have to go through a major reconceptualization of cities and um, uh, in particular urban space, because even the mobility uh, challenge, um, th the only solution to it, uh, which um, is able to address the, the multiplicity of crises that we are having uh, together and not one by one, well, I believe is only if we reconceptualize uh, mobility, but urban space. Um, so, um, if you look at just climate change alone, even that, of course, and I'm sure the previous speakers, pre speakers already mentioned that cities have a, a very important role in tackling climate change because over 70% uh, our European population lives in cities globally and not only in Europe, uh, close to 80% of GDP is uh, produced in cities. So that means close to that amount of uh, emissions are originating ultimately from cities. But, um, uh, and there are lots of commitments to, uh, to net zero cities and, and, and uh, radical reductions. But so far, a lot of these are really capitalizing on uh, imports. So still importing uh, net uh, carbon-free energy. But what we really need is because we need to go to actually zero, there is a lot of criticism of net zero and, and we really actually have to go to zero. In order to be able to go to zero, everybody needs to go to zero. So we, that means we, it's better if, if we can do it within the city. And for that, I see two major um, challenges or major areas for solutions. And one is, as we mentioned, the reconceptualizing of, uh, of public space, because presently the vast majority of public space, especially in European uh, cities, is owned by uh, or belongs to the to, to cars, to uh, to automobiles, and uh, and um, 
And that is really an impediment to actually, uh, for a lot of things that also the previous speakers mentioned that we need more parks and more, um, more uh, other types of urban space, but also for other mobility solutions. So I can't allow my kids to go by bike to school because simply it's not safe. And whereas it's taken for granted that if I want to go from A to B, every city has to offer me a safe and, um, and fully, uh, perfectly, comfortably paved Oh, um, uh, connection through uh, roads. And for, for my automobile, there is absolutely no expectation that the same have to happen for, uh, for bicycles or for other types of, uh, of uh, mobility, uh, non-motorized mobility. And I think the pandemic has really shown that, uh, that we, we just have to start to be brave and reallocate uh, public space to other types of also mobility, but also other types of activities. And, and um, because the problem is that, yes, smart city is a nice um, concept, but as uh, previous uh, speakers already mentioned, smart city is only as smart as the people who, who designed it. And there can be lots of traps because for example, you know, we can as have, have as smart cars as possible and then and as clean energy as possible. But if everybody switches to automated uh, electric vehicles, that means and affordable electric uh, vehicles, that means we, the, our cities are just going to be clogged and we are not going to be able to um, to uh, get around. So we do have to have other solution, uh, other solutions. And finally, my uh, my last point where I think. Um, urban solutions where we need a transformative thinking in urban solutions is the built environment that there is still a lot of new construction when we have to get to zero we cannot afford all the embodied uh, carbon and embodied energy and embodied um, pollution uh, in new building materials we have to just live and use what we have and instead of building new we should reconstruct what we have but we we know by today how to reconstruct to net zero every single building could be net zero in europe at least uh, and zero energy not carbon net zero energy um, user and uh, I think that uh, we just have to show in our cities we don't have time. We have to go in this direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we've talked about cities, and now we'll turn to two major European cities um, to hear what you're doing and how this is working on the ground. Um, so we'll start with Vienna. Uh, Omar al uh, city councillor, uh, please. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for the beginning, how we started about that. I think two things. Today I had a meeting with the vice mayor of uh, Budapest and we agreed that historically many cities done a lot of things which were, which were smart, but they didn't think about labeling it as smart and they're um, uh, seeing it now afterward. The second thing is uh, how to to, to, to communicate it with your citizens, because if you tell them a concept and they read it, read it like that and it has to be sustainable and SDG and I don't know what, and nobody knows what this really means. And the third thing is don't think that uh, smart cities is only a pure technological solution because we don't understand smart city that the refrigerator is, is uh, uh, filling itself automatically. And maybe you would see a lot of cities which are maybe in, in, in terms of, of technologies smarter, further, yes? But the, the first question I always ask myself, would I like to live there? And then very soon I say, no, they are maybe you know, fascinating, but I don't like, I would never, like to live there and that's the thing that brings us to the point we have many pillars where we, are, where we, we should deal with. The first one is like uh, the previous lady who said we have a lot of, of challenges we can't wait. This is the, the climate crisis. I remember I'm a civil engineer when I started to work 40 years ago in Austria we were all the time thinking how to make thermical uh, uh, things in the buildings because it's too cold. Now we're discussing in Vienna how to compete the heat. 
So it's not the, the it's not not the the, the 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 cold challenge. It's not the heat challenge. Uh, it's not more a matter of uh, of ideology. It's a matter of survival. This is one of the challenges we have as cities. We have to deal. You have the second uh, challenge in the city that I mentioned. If you like to live there in this city, is the terms of life quality. And this is one of the pillars. And the third pillar is how to deal with innovations and with conservation of resources. So these three things we've done, and one of these pillars in Vienna when we talk about life quality is we decided that the social cohesion is the heart of our smart city strategy. So anything you have to do, you have to have it satisfaction and an inclusive city for all we could then maybe, I don't know if want to hear the, the best uh, good practice uh, examples now or later, but uh, when I travel, I, I was once in Dubai, everybody would uh, say that Dubai is a fantastic smart city, very, very, very uh, developed. But then you talk to the people and say, how is the situation? They say, yes, but it's very expensive. I can't really afford the, the, the flat. I have to live in Sharjah or in Ajban because there is cheaper. But the problem is that the next thing is every day I have to stay two hours in the traffic jam going to my work to Dubai. So I have to start at five o'clock to reach it two hours back. Then I can't afford the kindergartens for my kids. I have to give them and then, and then the health care and all these things. And when then at the end, it's fantastic. It's everything futuristic. But when you have the whole challenges, what's happening with your social housing, affordable living, your health care, your public space, uh, the security of my kids, could they bike uh, or not, uh, uh, how to do this, all these things have to be really implemented. And when we say at the end that we make a, a smart city strategy, these are the guidance to the planners, to the, uh, to the innov uh, innovators, to everybody. Think in every solutions you do, don't forget the social cohesion and the affordability for the people. Don't forget in anything you plan and do uh, the, the resources conservation because these are things maybe you never get back. And uh, don't forget the life quality and don't forget to use the whole innovation in terms of technical uh, solutions for all them. For example, I give you another example, one of the smart solutions we've done in Vienna, it, it, it might yet be silly for someone, but we opened recently, three weeks ago, the, fo the first IKEA store, IKEA, you know, the, the Swedish uh, uh, mobile house. It's in the city. You know, normally everybody knows IKEA is somewhere outside. You can't reach it with a car, there's no parking space in it. You have to go, it's, uh, and uh, you can purchase them the things and it will be delivered or you can collect it yourself. And because it's a very beautiful place, uh, mid in Vienna, where from the roof you could see to the castle of Schönbrunn and the whole city, we made a contract with IKEA that this roof is open for everybody and we have a non-consumption area. So every Viennese who would like to enjoy because it's very nice green and fantastic, they can go out, can look at Vienna, they can bring their drinks themselves. So it's inclusive. It's for everybody accessible. If you don't have a car, you just you can go to IKEA to buy, and we reduced uh, uh, we, we reduced uh, the, the traffic, and we reduced the everybody collecting all uh, the uh, the furnitures uh, they buy there. Yeah, this is one one a very small uh, example how you could focus in everything you plan and you do, and I think that the terms of urban planning and uh, the green yards in Vienna, I'm also responsible for, the, for, for uh, the spokesman for the city development plant, that 50% of the city has to stay green. And then we took all of resi resilient cities, resilient cities, now the last pandemic showed us who is resilient and who is not resilient. And, and that was the, the lacmus test, test we say, the how to see is it possible to survive or not. And I think this is the most important thing. And at the end, you have to, because I was all the time as politician thinking when we uh, implemented the smart city strategy in Vienna and I made the, the, the speech and the, the, the city council, I was all the time thinking, 
if you go to the citizens, to your voters, you have to tell them stories and they have to understand what you're meaning. But just smart cities, this is a label and how they can, can deal with it. And I think it's also a matter of how, how you can sell it also with a, a sense of humor. So when we started, for example, to, uh, to make the, the savage treatment in, in Vienna for, for the sewage, uh, we, we made the placard that we turn your business into electricity, for example. That was a funny thing. Or when we, uh, the Manner Schnitten, this is one of the most famous biscuits uh, produced in Vienna, uh, we, we made with them a deal that the whole energy that is uh, supplied back to the, to, the, to the city in the remote heat. We made the placard, we heat with chocolate. Yeah? So everybody was there. Th these are uh, some labels where people could really start to identify uh, with these uh, uh, positions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and last but not least, uh, the Deputy Mayor of Frankfurt, Eileen O'Sullivan. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so, Frankfurt is a very international city and Frankfurt is a transport hub and Frankfurt has so many people that are active in civil society organizations that are innovative and I think when we talk about these buzzwords as I think many here have said, a smart city and overall also democratic transformation, I guess for me one of the questions is how do we utilize the tools that technology and digitalization has given us to transform democratic processes, to transform the way citizens understand politics and the way that they can engage. Because I think many, many of you have already said this, how do we actually use public spheres to bring it back to the citizens? And we can do that also through tools of digitalization. How do we empower citizens to be able to take the space that they need, that they, um, that they should have? How do we, talking about cars, I mean, if you conceptualize looking at cars and actually thinking this is a piece of someone's property parked in, in, in a public space, if you start looking at cars like that, I think it really transforms the way you understand mobility and um, see that you know someone that rides a bike takes up way less space than a car. And isn't that something that we should look at as an opportunity also to promote bike riding, for example, and make bike riding safer as it, for example, is in Copenhagen, to actually see what opportunities we have to give the city back to the citizens um, as part of an environmental transformation, as a democratic and political transformation that we can go through. Um, with regards to smart city and these buzzwords, I, I think I agree that a lot of um, local councils and cities have started using smart city as a sort of an excuse to seem transformative when actually a lot of things that have already happened and should be happening and are expected to happen in the 21st century are now being implemented. But I think that with if we look at smart city technologies, looking at, for example, vacancy management, looking at um, inner cities that have really suffered throughout the pandemic too, what can we do to actually use this space and, for example, support startups, support science, um, people that have ideas to bring them back into the inner cities and as such democratize also the space that we do have um, instead of commercializing it um, and support commercial places to then, for example, step, uh, step up their online game, step up their transformation hub game, have um, mobility hubs and trans transport hubs outside of the city and as such and um, be more environmentally friendly by not having all these parcel deliveries driving into town, creating more pollution. So I think that all of these transformations that we're going through currently in the year 2021 and that the pandemic has pushed, these can also all be enhanced through digital transformation and as such also um, have a value of being a democratic transformation. And I definitely think that's worth talking about if we call it smart city or not. But I, I think the question at the end of the day is what is the purpose of a smart city? And it is to help engage with the citizens to enhance democracies. And that is what I think we really want to do to do in Frankfurt now. Um, thanks very much. Um, I want to throw out a bit of a challenge to the whole panel, um, and maybe that's only my impression, but uh, what often strikes me is when I hear experts and practitioners that there's a gap, um, and that the gap is that the transformation 
which the experts say will have to come to achieve these is a long way away from what is actually happening. Uh, that's not to say what is happening is not good, is not positive, but if we really are talking about a fundamental change, like for example, taking away people's cars, um, I'm putting it very aggressively, but I, I think in the end, we are talking about something which will affect every person's lives. And do we have the systems, the politics, um, to actually go that far? Or is that something which will not be acceptable uh, to citizens in the end? Please. Well, th there, there was yesterday, somebody mentioned paradigm change. And uh, paradigm changes take centuries. And paradigm changers are normally burnt. Uh, that's the way it goes uh, with uh, Galileo or, or Copernicus. Uh, they were not, not favored when uh, you know they came up with this stupid idea that it's not uh, the heavens above and the the earth in the middle and and um, the underworld down, but uh, you know it's the earth is not the center of the universe. Uh, nobody believed it, so so that's paradigm change is hard and dangerous, uh, especially for par paradigm changers. Um, two things I wanted to mention. One, I don't think that road space is public space. Um, road space is private space. Because the definition of a pr uh, public space is that it's open to all. Uh, and obviously, road space is very much closed um, and rented out permanently by multiple users. So, so let's be you know, uh, clear. Public space is a place where anyone, anyone is welcome. Um, and I was not fair to Vienna because it's a city I love and where I live, and it is an exemplary city to live in from, uh, from many, many aspects. And it is inclusive, and it is um, sustainable in the sense that it's climate friendly. So, so I, you know, I have to congratulate Vienna, um, which has, you know, a uh, hundred years of history. Of, of doing so, and, uh, and many cities, so you asked me an example, and I think Vienna is a good example. Um, but to, to, to do paradigm change is, you know, do a lot of talking and practitioners will eventually listen and, and practices will adopt because people can only imagine what they can imagine. So there needs to be an, a change in my language, a change in the imaginary how we imagine the world. And um, this imagination can be helped by unearthing stuff. You spoke about cars. Cars, I don't know if you know, kill uh, more than two million people every year. And 100 million people are injured. Um, 80 million people have been killed by cars in the last century. Uh, and there are almost no public mem memorials. There are memorials to wars, there are memorials to many things. Um, actually, Budapest is one of the places, I don't know if you knew, um, even the Hungarians usually don't know. Uh, there is a public memorial in the third district, and Prague is another one. But mostly, what I suggest practitioners, if they want to get rid of cars, um, mark the streets with blood, red signs that everybody sees that an accident has happened here. Make public memorials that bikers have been hit. And then the imaginaries will change because then it won't be the car manufacturers who preach how great cars are now coming electric and autonomous, but people will see that they're bloody dangerous and people die. And then Diana and I can allow our children bike freely. Well, I'll, I'll turn to Diana because I wanted to pick up something uh, which was just mentioned. Paradigm shift takes centuries. Um, now, given um, the panel you're sitting on, I don't think we have centuries. Uh, how would you say it? You just stole my thunder. <laughs> Unfortunately,
but we don't have centuries. In fact, we don't have decades. In fact, we are already late, but uh, it doesn't mean that we should, should give up. But I think this last report of the IPCC that was published early August was an eye-opener even for me still, that uh, whatever, whatever temperature we want to stabilize climate at, even if you go to three, four, five, six, ten, we still have to go to, to zero, zero carbon emissions. So there is no choice in that. The only choice is if we do it later, we will stabilize the climate, let's say five, 10 degrees warmer than pre-industrial. If we go to zero now, then we could still keep this at a fairly livable level as one and a half or perhaps two degrees. So that means we don't have time, but you're absolutely right. I really love uh, the question that there is a huge gap. And, and that's, I think the most visible this gap is if we go to the COP. And I'm not sure how many of you will be there, but I'm sure you're going to showcase a lot of fantastic best practices. And I'm not disputing that they are fantastic best practices, but as one walks around at the COP, at the climate conference and says, oh, <laughs> everything is great. I mean, we must be just really solving this thing as everything is is so fantastically smart and 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 digital and clean and zero and everything but then we are just going to see the second or perhaps the biggest increase in carbon dioxide emissions ever so so okay where is uh, the difference and i i think the and and I, it would be great to have paradigm shifts but but for for a long time i've been trying to understand how come that we have been saying this for for 30 years that we are really uh, rushing towards the cliff and and, and nobody's doing anything um and, and understand why and we have the technologies we know that it's not going to break the bank so why is this not happening and uh, there are of course many many um many answers and different people and different uh, sciences will give different answers. But I think one very crucial problem is, is simply the decision-making systems are not, um, they are just incapable of taking any future perspectives in, uh, in, uh, in, in sight because every mayor is appointed for four years. Maybe, maybe if you're lucky, you get reappointed, but still you are a fool if you really are taking a long-term interest into account because you will you will lose. The same with, with the prime minister, the same with the ruling party, the same with companies. No company can really build for or, or invest in, in investments that return in 20 years or 50 years or, or so on. So right now, decision-making cycles just cannot take into account our slightly longer-term interest. And that's, I think, extremely difficult and also, that I think these, especially in cities, these um, steps that we have been talking about start with very unpopular first steps. I mean, let's see just the example of Budapest with trying to reallocate some of the road space to, to bicycles. Of course, there has been a lot of upheaval. And yes, at the beginning, it's really difficult, but because to make the first steps uh, for many people to, to really shift and, and initially, until you can really get from A to B comfortably and safely by bike, you will not, few people will really use it. And those few who will use it are, are experienced a lot of uh, discomfort and the same with cars. So the, this, the, while you have this hybrid, it's, it's challenging. So uh, I think it's, I don't have a solution and it would be great if, if our, our practitioner colleagues uh, give a solution, but I'm afraid to, uh, to challenge a bit uh, the previous speaker, I don't think that parent time shifts or just talking about will help because most of our science shows that actual behavior change won't happen based on information. And the more information give, it doesn't help. The, what, 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 a lot, what we see in behavior science, what helps is, is the only times when we really do change behavior significantly is when there is a, a huge, big um, shift in our lives. For example, when we give birth, when we have a new job, when we move uh, or something like that. That's the only chance when we can have uh, adopt new lifestyles. And this pandemic was nothing else but this. It was a mega laboratory expense, a, a planetary laboratory experiment for, for such a chance that, that everybody could have adopted different lifestyle. And, and anyway, we had to reflect on why we are here and what's good and what's really our quality of life and so on. And still we completely wasted this chance. 
So I would be very interested what the practitioner colleagues say, but after the, the failure of uh, us uh, capitalizing on the enormous chances, sustainability transformation chances that this pandemic gave us, um, it's uh, to me, it's very um, bleak, the, the future, how we can really tackle this gap or, or bridge this gap that was in the question. Please to all feel free to come in, but Eileen, you mentioned about uh, democratization, actually having uh, involvement of citizens in these decisions. Um, that clashes a bit with this idea that the decision-making processes, um, that the long-term um, horizons which we need to, to take into account aren't taking into account in politics. So how do we square that circle? Um, I think what, what we're talking about, these environmental changes that need to happen, I think we are an incredibly privileged academic group sitting here, and I think many of us understand the challenges of climate change, and we have, we're wealthy enough to work around them. But a majority, I think, of our societies actually don't necessarily have these means. So to me, the question is, how do we create a majority that understands that we have a challenge, and I think many people do, but at the same time are able to actually work around um, this changing landscape that we will have to have, as in having less cars. If we look at Frankfurt, for example, um, we have incredibly high prices in housing. So, for example, um, a, a mother raising her children by herself that works in the inner city has to take the car if she wants to get into town because she simply, for example, doesn't have the right bus line in front of her house or the trains that she can reach and she maybe doesn't even have the time to hop onto a bike, bring her kids to the kindergarten and then get to her shift if she's not running a night shift uh, in a hospital, for example. So I think those are realities that we also need to take into account when we're having these kind of discussions because we're really talking on a very hypothetical level here where we can think of solutions that sound great and that are environmentally really good, but are we actually talking about socially friendly changes too? And I think that's where these tools that you know I think we should really start implementing um, come at hand. So how do we create more democratic debates that are maybe simply debates? We don't have to come together and have one solution as a society in the city, but how do we reach those people that don't usually participate in local politics, for example? It's the same people that go to vote every four to five years. It's usually the same people that come to the committees and listen and speak about citizens, but what's actually with the people that don't have the time to participate? How do we create formats in which we can make their voices heard, understand their needs, and then also take those into account when we want to implement change that, that changes that will help us reach these climate goals. I mean, it is it is fairly late, let's be honest, yes, but there's still something that we have to do. So how do we reach those goals and actually make more people involved and make their life changes sustainable and adaptable to the changes that need to happen as a fact? Um, you emphasized for Vienna that uh, you're very inclusive in the way you're approaching this. Is there a clash between achieving these objectives and the inclusiveness? Well, uh, one of the questions even you raised in, in, in the preparing for this session is, is uh, what are the competencies of different cities? And this, this is also a big, uh, because a mayor is not a mayor. And uh, Vienna, thanks God, we have a, the mayor is not only responsible for, for the gardens and cleaning the street, but it's also for the health care, for the, for, for, uh, for the kindergartens, for school, for social housing, for public transportation. So you can, you can easily uh, give a solution, an inclusive solution. But one of the things uh, my colleague from Frankfurt mentioned is, is the housing problem. And this is, this is the big issue that we said, uh, everyone who wants to live in Vienna should afford and has the possibility to live in Vienna. And that's why our social housing program, we are in Vienna, we have 61% uh, of all Viennese lives either in a, in, a, in a flat that belongs to the city of Vienna or is subsidized by the city of Vienna. And one of the, uh, the laws we changed three years ago uh, uh, is any uh, developer who wants to rezone its, uh, its uh, ground and build a new, uh, a new uh, building for, 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 for living areas, two thirds two -third of all the flats that will uh, be built new has to be 
uh, in affordable living uh, price class. So we managed that the, the speculation on the ground went a little back, and, and that's why people who live in the city produce less CO2 uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a dense city where living in density doesn't mean uh, a bad uh, life quality. Uh, you, you, you could have innovative uh, solution better than having all the time people leaving the city, coming uh, in the city, living in, in, in rural areas. And, uh, and this, this social, this social uh, point of, of being an inclusive city must be, I think we have also to be, to be very honest to the people that at the end, everybody of us is going to change it, his, his lifestyle. Yeah? We will have some solutions technically, we could have the solutions in a different way, but at the end, everybody ha would change it, his or her lifestyle, but that doesn't mean that the life quality will suffer under that. And I think that, I think that we need all also some positive minds how, how to create, for example, riding a bicycle could be a lifestyle, not only just uh, uh, being in a, in a green area. One of the most funny uh, things that I ever uh, uh, experienced myself, I once posted a photo that I'm going with a bicycle to the, to the city council and uh, maybe people, maybe they could see it from my name. I was born in Baghdad and this photo was in Iraq. One of the, it, it was a viralic uh, uh, passed by all Facebook, not because the Iraqis drive bicycle and they never thought of driving that and it's a car society, but they were fascinated that a politician has no uh, security and blue lights and police in front and behind him. And just of this point of view, they said, oh my God, this is something fantastic. And the, the bicycle riding was at the, uh, at the moment one of the most fascinating uh, situation. So maybe sometimes if we could think out of the box and try to sell <laughs> a solution in a way how someone could accept it and find it, uh, for example, if I ride a bicycle that I am young, I am modern, I am uh, hip, or I am uh, uh, as a politician uh, near to the people or whatever, yeah? That could maybe help to the solutions. I think we see it now with the vaccination. You have two kinds of, of, of persuading the people by frightening them, so this is the solution of uh, making the street with blood and, and tell them if you drive a car you're killing the people, or you have a more positive attitude how to attract them and take them inside, but I'm with a colleague here before that information alone will, will not be enough. I think it's a combination of everything, uh, trying to persuade, trying to, to implement things uh, that at the end you have to do it and uh, and try also to persuade and to win the people to be part part of this of this wave of solutions. Thanks. Um, please feel free to come back to this also in the discussion. But I wanted to to also turn a bit on one of the points which um, Diana made, um, which I, I think is a very interesting one to look at, and that's the impact of the pandemic. Um, what we've seen in many cities uh, is a very significant change um, to traffic patterns, to working at home. Um, there is a question, and Diana was rather uh, negative about it, um, but there is a question of how have these changes affected cities? And is there a strategy of how we can actually maintain the positive impacts uh, of what has happened? And I'm saying that also with respect, I live in Brussels. Um, what I see in Brussels now, uh, I might be wrong, but uh, my impression is that traffic is going back um, to pre-crisis uh, levels, uh, that actually in some ways, maybe there's even more pressure on road traffic because people are more reluctant uh, to take uh, the public transport solutions. Um, so have we missed? this opportunity to make these changes um, or are there ways we can still lock in some of uh, the, the more positive aspects? Um, I don't know whether anyone wants yeah, to. Well, well, I think uh, in, in, in terms of, of this pandemic, for example, we were very glad in Vienna that we had the concept that 50% of the city should be green. So at the beginning, I remember one year ago when everything was locked down, it was allowed to, to, to walk and to enjoy. But I must uh, confess that not the green places are not everywhere in Vienna. There are some places you have more green than you could uh, 
uh, you could consume and other places not. Uh, we noticed that it was a good decision that uh, our uh, commitment to public utilities, that uh, the energy, the, the, the hospitalization, all the things uh, should be, uh, should be in, in the hand of uh, even public transportation in the hand of the communities, that was a, a good decision. We were glad that we didn't reduce the capacity of our health capacity and everybody was telling us statistics, you are over, uh, over hospitalized and you have too much beds and that is not, uh, it's too expensive and try to reduce it. That was a, a decision where we said it's okay. We were glad that uh, the, the investment in the infrastructure for the internet uh, happened. But uh, I must confess, in, even in my company, my company was against, uh, I'm a civil engineer, was against home office, and now they noticed, well, it's a possibility, why not? So, so it helped uh, sometimes in, 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 in uh, changing the minds, but we have, for example, uh, in terms of schooling and the kids and the second generation, I don't think that, that, that house schooling is the, the only solution, uh, especially in, in, in terms of, uh, uh, people which comes with, with migration background uh, and so on. Uh, uh, some of them got lost. The teacher are looking for them. They don't know where they are. Uh, in terms of, of uh, the social cohesion, everybody, could everybody afford to have a laptop at home? Uh, was it possible? So, so these social issues were very, very important uh, also to, to rethink uh, in the thing. So everybody who says the pandemic didn't change, I think it had some <laughs> it's terrible to say some things where we could act or uh, learn positively from it and and uh, many things would chose the lack and 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 the problems that we had in dealing in our society how how to 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 rethink it again I, I, I think that um, one of the learnings from the pandemic is that uh, there are no one-size-fits-all solutions in in Austria um, <coughs> every year 2,000 children are lost from schools and uh, after the pandemic or during the pandemic this increased to 6,000 um, so I wouldn't lock in anything because I think when we try to generalize that's the old way of thinking um, I think instead of sustainable democracy we need ag agonistic experimental democracies um, we have to realize that we don't know um, I'm a philosopher, so I look for solutions in ancient Greece. Uh, so everything started in ancient Greece. Everything went wrong in ancient Greece, and I'll give you an example. Um, ancient Greece, Athens relied on politicians. They were called the rhetores, the rhetors. Um, in the city assembly, the rhetors, the rhetors convinced the people one way or the other. But they were not the only politicians because in the assembly there were idiotes, they were idiots. And contrary to what idiotes, idiots uh, acquired this meaning in the middle, late Middle Ages, actually idiotes were private individuals who were interested in politics. And they could participate in the political process not as decision makers, but as speech givers. And the biggest fight in Athens democracy was between the idiotes, the ordinary people who didn't know, and the rhetores who claimed they know. Unfortunately, they won. Um, but maybe we should return to the idiotes. Maybe we should realize that we don't know. And I don't want to disappoint you, but science is no answer. Science is a political tool. Science was invented in the 16th, 17th centuries because people were absolutely out of space with the religious wars in Europe. And they wanted peace. And that's when science as we know it came to play because it was claimed that science is religiously neutral and it's speaking the truth. I think one of the most important paradigm changing thoughts is we do not know. So we need small scale, continuous experiments and try to learn from that. Real life, small scale experiments 
and should accept that something works for one, it might not and doesn't work for someone else. And that's not the way we think. And that's not the way capitalism works and that's not the way modernity works, which is looking for efficiency, which is looking for economies of scale. So maybe we should give up these notions and that might help. Um, thanks very much. Um, I am aware um, y you will have to go on time. Um, I will overrun a bit given that we um, started late, um, but I want to give you a chance also to make any reflections um, before you have to go. Um, I also wanted to, to ask the audience um, if there is anyone who wants to come in with a question or a comment, uh, then please indicate. I think I can just about see here. So there's certainly one. Uh, so I'll come to that after that, but uh, given the time, um, I'll give you the chance um, before you have to catch a train. Thank you. <coughs> I am a real estate expert, so I am not I have some good news, uh, for example, in the latest uh, years, uh, there are uh, <coughs> uh, available green loans, for example, which is uh, m uh, much better for the uh, uh, real estate developer, but in uh, uh, that case, the developer has to make sustainable solutions in the buildings. So this is also a good news, and also uh <coughs> uh, the subsidies are linked to the sustainable solutions uh, when somebody would like to uh <coughs> uh, develop a new uh, building. And not only uh, the, uh, we talk, uh, not only the bricks, but also where are these buildings, where are the surround, and, and uh, how can then develop the whole area with the kindergarten and so on. So not, not only uh, concentrating on, for example, the, the uh, uh, housing estate, but also the whole surround to decrease, for example, the traffic. Because if you, the mix is good uh, between the buildings, the functions, the traffic is uh, much lower need for the people. So that's why it's, uh, for example, good in Vienna that they uh, deconcentrated, deconcentrated the, the um, authorities and you can uh, uh, do uh, uh, something not just in the city center, but also uh, the other districts. So that could be a, a very good example. So uh, I think uh, for the uh, real estate developer, that would be very good to have a, a city uh, um, uh, plan in which they can do what is the future in, in the uh, 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 plot around, and they can uh, apply their uh, building their uh, uh, development according to the whole area. And when it is harmonized, that would be much better for the whole uh, uh, citizens to decreasing the emission and so on. So uh, we could uh, not only concentrate on the building, zero emission, but we could uh, uh, also concentrate on the whole area to decrease the traffic and so on. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I was going to uh, take any questions now. Um, I've seen one. If there's anyone else, then please wave. Um, so I've got the lights in my eyes, so I don't see anyone else. So we'll take that one. Thank you. Um, I'm Gaspar Bekes. I'm the president of the Sustainable Democracy Associ Association Hungary, and thank you for this wonderful panel. And I have Two questions, and the, the first one is basically, you talked about the human security aspect. Uh, Mr. Brown, you've talked about the human security aspect of environmental protection, so how visualizing uh, the threat to cyclists is an effective way of communication to convince people of imminent threats versus well, long-term threats of, for example, climate change. So what would be the practical solutions uh, in this case? So for example, data visualization when it comes to air pollution or or smart metering, or what would be the practical smart city solutions that help people visualize the very imminent threats of environmental change or pollution? And the, the second part is that what is the role of, of youth in the smart city 
question. Uh, young people are often called digital natives, so therefore they are the most susceptible to implementing smart technologies from apps to Internet of Things. So w how do you see uh, young people driving this change forward and what would be their role and how we can promote an intergenerational equity in the smart city transformation? Thank you. So please feel free, whoever wants to pick up the, the questions. Diana, if you're waving, then I'll know whether you want to come in as well. I wanted to come in for the previous question, so let's uh, now uh, let others answer this particular one. So I think um, that was a lot of question, but I'll, I'll answer what I remembered best. Um, and that was, I think, one of the questions around um, digital natives. Um, I myself would call myself a digital native. And I very much know that going back to this form of participation, I know that it's actually quite hard for young people to really participate in politics because there is obviously an age discrimination that does happen with people not uh, trusting young people that are under 30 to know what they're doing and um, how transformational processes should be implemented and where we should be going. And um, I think that's where, for example, these citizen assemblies could actually help in bringing together the age people, like the age gap is a real issue, right? And so bringing people together with experts, with scientists, may I say, because I do believe that we don't need technocrats in political positions, but we need politicians that are able to listen to science. And so having those, having citizens engage in new um, deliberate, deliberative democratic formats could very much help us in understanding which way we can go. At the same time, I think we, what we need to do is increase the way that um, our communities and societies actually bring these different generations together. So for example, um, you like what I often see is online when students look for jobs, um, sometimes there are these elderly senior people that are looking for um, younger people that actually need them to help them explain how their new laptop works or their, their smartphone works. And that is something that actually us as governments should also be able to take care of and support the elderly in understanding this digital transformation and not getting lost because that is also a question of equality, right? Everything can be digital. All our administrational offices can be digital. If those people that actually um, aren't as mobile as young individuals that can ride a bike, um, cannot go to the website and register, then what use is this? So I think that's a question of equality that we need to answer. And if I just may add, I, I just remember one of the things that you also said, like for example, in Frankfurt, we are c currently running this pilot project with having sensors dug into the earth next to trees, where by the Internet of Things, you can send these data packages around and actually know, okay, this water, this tree needs some water, instead of actually having people that walk around the city from like eight o'clock in the morning onwards to give all the plants water when not necessarily that's the most effective time to water plants. And I think in that way, for example, sustainability can be brought forward through this kind of smart, smart city technology and can be utilized in a way that helps us. Thank you. Anyone else wanted to come in? Yes, uh, for example, you know, th th these are goals. So you see the, the goals of a smart city. In Vienna, we have the goals on the, everybody knows this SDG. We, ha we want to reduce our energy uh, consumption by 30% to 2030 and 50% and so on and so on. But one of the, the goals also in terms of innovation is that uh, Vienna will be an innovation leader by 2030 and Vienna is digitalization capital uh, in Europe. So. So it plays interesting, a very, uh, 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 very sophisticated role. Uh, without that, somebody would uh, would realize that it's happening uh, uh, this way. Uh, and in terms, even now in the in the in the city planning, uh, we realized and started even to end in the, in our buildings consumption, because the way this is, young people don't have cars anymore. If I look to my children, my four only one has a car. And, and we started even now to reduce the, the, uh, the, 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 the parking spaces in new buildings. We used to have an obligation for one flat, one parking area. Now we reduce it to 100 square meter per parking area. 
and trying to to get uh, to get it back. Even we stopped to to build the, the parking space under the earth because you can't use it afterwards in, in some new uh, in some new uh, development areas. They are built uh, uh, on the land, not uh, at the end, uh, not at the, at the the flat itself. So you have to walk, and if someone has to walk, maybe he will. Uh, take the public transportation instead of taking his car, and this building you can uh, use it then for other uses because uh, it's 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 built up there, uh, and uh, we have the app of uh, the VM Vault, so you can ask the get answers of the city digitally, and we have the the, the Sax Veen, you, you you can tell the city anything you find that that is a problem. But as, as my colleague uh, said, at the end, we saw it now with the vaccination, we saw it with the Google test, you have some people who, for them, it's, it's, a, it's a problem to get to the, to the, to the, to the website, to, to, to register themselves. Uh, so when we said every ca everyone can come to vaccinate without a previous uh, uh, having an, uh, an appointment, suddenly many came and said, you know, it's for me too difficult to register, to keep my things come and just give me the peak and I want to, to go home. So we have, uh, I think the challenges are on, on many levels, how, how, how we, we say always this digital poor, how you, you manage that, that, that a lot of these, uh, these people, uh, maybe to social uh, uh, contents or maybe uh, of, uh, of uh, because of the age, uh, that they, they don't have this access. And, and this is the, the challenge, how to, to try to, to get both of them, but not to, not to to to, to let the digitalization is a, is is a, a solution for 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 many things. I take it on myself to be the conservative old grandfather. Um, I think it's great that you're digital natives. I think you're also digital naives, and um, I think that uh, much of the perils that this conference has been talking about social media wise and uh, the, the um, extreme polarization of societies partly is because of you being digital naives and you are using these technologies without actually reflecting on what they do. And I have to say that um, we have to be ex I'm not anti-technology, but we have to be extremely cautious of what these technologies, smart or otherwise, the worlds that they create, because they do create, they're world-making. And this is when I said I don't like the word solutions, because this is what solutionism does. It offers solutions that we are not reflecting on what kind of worlds they create. And I think that we have to be extremely vigilant of what dataification, onlineification creates, what kind of new ontologies in my world um, it will, forms of being, what is a datafied individual, what is happening with you as a being in the virtual world. Um, and um, I think we're too much um, buying into um, technology being now the solution to the perils of the, of the globe like climate change. And um, I would be, if I were in your shoes, I would be much more cautious. Um, um, it, it's actually sometimes good to be an old, to look like an old man. It's, it's great. So um, I, I will um, go towards the end of, of this panel. Um, I was tempted to ask you all whether we will manage these transformations, um, but I'm not sure that uh, I will be that optimistic if I hear the response. Um, so I'll ask you a different question because I, I think the key thing is that we will have to manage these transformations. They are happening, uh, they are necessary, so what do you think is the key factor, a key factor, which will determine whether we do this successfully? Uh, and particularly, of course, related to the panel, um, what uh, needs to 
be there for cities to be able to manage this. Um, and I'll go in the same order again, so if you want to pick up any other points from the discussion, please do so, um, but I'll start. Well, first and foremost, cities are great places to live. I think density is, is great, and the, the bigger the density, the better, um, because um, well-being and quality of life depends on density, better schools, better health care. Um, also, I think that um, when we think of our systems, as it's called, we should be more heuristic, because you mentioned that the, um, the, the lady who is uh, raising her kids in, in the outskirts needs to take a car to go somewhere. Maybe we should rethink not only the, our mobilities, but the way we work, the way we consume, how, what we consume, how we consume, um, how we create our public spaces, and then maybe that proverbial lady um, can work at home, one solution, um, work in a co-working co space nearby, um, so, so there are, I think if we want to tackle, and not solve, so tackle the challenges that we have, we have to be much more heuristic in our thinking, and there are no yardsticks that can, should, may remain the same. I think everything needs to change. How we work, how we live, how we um, organize our life, and how we imagine our life. And if I can warn, then don't fall prey to easy technological solutions. They are definitely not the way forward. Diana. Thank you, and perhaps uh, this will be a chance for me to be able to reflect on the previous uh, two questions that uh, I didn't get a chance, but they were very interesting. So um, again, getting back to the pandemic, yes, of course, there were bad, very many bad aspects and, and bad impacts and negative impacts. But I think the question was about what are the positive and how can preserve the, we preserve the positive? And that's extremely important because the, what the pandemic did for us is to accelerate exactly some of those processes that we know we need to do anyway in order to get to an energy transition or to, to a, a net zero or climate neutrality. And one of that is urban smart cities is part, smartness is part because it's the digitalization and the digital um, transformation and more service orientation rather than stuff and product orientation and, and shifting more of our lives to, uh, to into the digital uh, universe. And that's what we are doing now. <laughs> and probably three years ago, this would not have been possible that I, I would not, it would not have been acceptable that I'm giving this talk online while you are sitting there. And today it's perfectly normal. So there are things in uh, also uh, in citizen that we have already adopted, but I think we need to think this forward and take this forward. Um, for example, we talked a lot about personal mobility, but we talked very little about uh, things mobility, so urban logistics. And I think that's where a really big um, challenge we still have in, uh, in the era of digitalization, because uh, the pandemic also accelerated more e-commerce, so more online shopping. We never talk about the urban um, consequences of, of, of cities uh, uh, of this, but uh, the result is that there are these different, uh, you know, 10 different supermarkets and online shopping chains and, and, and different delivery um, services are running around uh, the city and these are trucks, these are, these are really occupying a lot of space, not even talking about, uh, not even talking about the emissions. So in order, to, and, and we are not even trying to optimize this, and clearly it will not be possible. Perhaps we can optimize it by company by company, but while we try to optimize it company by company, it's not going to work. It's only going to um, work if you optimize it at the whole uh, city level, at a systemic level. But then we could have a breakthrough because uh, optimizing uh, shipping within a city uh, at the whole urban scale would certainly make a tremendous difference. And equally, I think where we are still very um, 19th century and we are so far from a far smart city, we, we tend to be very um, good about or very proud about public transport and, and, and we could be, but, but let's think about it. We are still in 
I think our public transport model is still very much 20th century, not uh, 21st century, because we are still running fixed routes, fixed timetables. Why aren't we in the era of big data and everybody's every movement being constantly tracked um, by whichever company, doesn't matter, uh, companies? Why aren't we utilizing much more of this information to have uh, urban mobility also demand-based and individually based? So, so sharing mobility, I think we need to transform our, our really old fashioned uh, public transport system to more shared mobility, much more flexible and demand-based uh, shared mobility, which is much more optimized. So in, uh, so, um, in summary, yes, uh, there is tremendous opportunities in digitalization, but alone this won't work. We also need to reconceptualize a lot of some of our uh, really rusty and uh, old thinking about what the city is. And I agree with Robert fully that we have to do almost everything different and we have to be bold in having to change this. And I don't envy the politicians who have to start changing these, but we don't have any other choice. We have to go for it. Thank you. Yeah, I think that one, one, uh, one thing that would also has to be uh, uh, rethinked again is coming back uh, to to think about values and many new values, and one of these values is the solidarity. Uh, that uh, uh, with this pandemic, many people, uh, it was a, really a shame that Europe, the, the innovation uh, uh, continent, uh, was not able to produce masks. Uh, they had to import it from China. We didn't have a disinfection metal that had to come from India. Uh, we uh, Now we have a problem with the chips, the cars, uh, in, in Germany, they're, they're uh, going to, to Kurzarbeit again because uh, the things are not coming. Uh, a, a big uh, ship in Suez Canal uh, stands, and then the, the whole uh, the, the whole logistics uh, collapses. Uh, and 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 then even in in terms of this stupid uh, nationalism, and uh, when, when the borders were closed, the, the whole nurseries. Uh, and, and elder houses in, 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 in Vienna and Austria collapsed. The, the Romanians didn't come, and uh, the, uh, the farmers couldn't make the harvest because uh, the people from, from Slovakia didn't come to help. So, so many people suddenly started to rethink many, many, many things, and I, I think that should be a chance uh, to start really a, a new discussion how to to rethink uh, our values, how to, to deal uh, with each other. Suddenly the heroes, the heroes of the, of the day were the, uh, the, the ladies working in the supermarkets with, the, with really very bad wages. These were the heroes. Uh, and um, I can remember when uh, one engineer came to me, my company and said, I'm afraid I don't want to work because there's now a pandemic. And do I have to work? And I said, yes, of course, why not? And, and, and I said, you see, the, uh, this lady down there, she's selling also. And she he said, yeah, this, is, this is system immanent, em but I'm an engineer, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, the doctor. I said, well, if the doctor don't work and the nurse don't work, who is going then to work? And, uh, and you as an engineer, you have to, to keep the infrastructure working. So, so I think that, uh, that it's, it's, really a, it's really a chance uh, to, to rethink a lot of things and solutions we thought it's, uh, it, it, it's already uh, cleared and I think that we have to rethink it. And uh, uh, we mentioned at the beginning that a lot of these problems and emissions and social uh, tensions are in cities, but don't forget that the whole innovation, the whole solutions, uh, the whole, uh, if it's technical or even philosophical solutions, come also from from the cities so so don't look at this place where the the, the densest people create a, a lot of problems they could also deliver a, a very big uh, chance of solutions and i think that trying to to get back to to many values we were certain uh, certainly in vienna very glad that we had farmers so we we could have our uh, our slow food <laughs> production was 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 possible and and maybe not only always think how we could maximize uh, our our earnings and our profit 
uh, and and uh, and uh, leave the production in, in, in other places and at the end when there is a crisis we couldn't uh, deal with it I think uh, coming back to your question we will we will manage it maybe less uh, than than good but at the end we have we have not we have <laughs> we don't have another choice uh, uh, climate uh, crisis is coming we saw the floods in Germany people at the end will will f force this change also by voting maybe it takes a lot of uh, of time and if you don't if you don't respond to these challenges uh, then you are the loser at the end and uh, and everybody wants to survive but i think that solidarity and, and keeping together in the society in the nations in the whole in the whole world is one of the most important thing i think uh, we human beings wouldn't survive if we n never lived solid in, in a sort of solidarity, either in a community, in a family, or where else. Nick. So I think there are many things that we have to do <laughs> because um, a digital transformation is coming. It doesn't matter if governments are ready for it or not. We are um, maybe even a bit too late to be reactive. There are a lot of companies, as Ms. Urgefordat said, there are so many companies already collecting our data. I mean, everyone that has a smartphone here, we're probably all being tracked in one way or another. So I think the question is how do we have the, you know, we need to expect from policymakers and governments to be faster than the big companies and be able to have ethical standards and to be able to think about how are we going to use data and we have to make it open. We have to be able to let, for example, local startups, local innovators be able to create these new programs that we will need for the digitization and digitalization of our cities. So I think a lot of the transformation that we are going to go through needs to be around citizen empowerment, needs to be about thinking faster than companies, being able to allow transformation, being able to think, yes, I think we need to think a lot of things in a very new way and we need to sort of be able to revolutionize our cities and the way politics work, um, you know, and, and I think there are so many cool things that came from this pandemic. We have so many people, as was said, farmers in Vienna, that is really cool. In Frankfurt, we have urban farming that is now coming up. That is something like bringing back farming to big cities or even starting that. Those are so many really nice, innovative things that empower citizens to take the time to be outside, to farm, to be in touch with nature, to live the city in a different way, and that needs like we need to be able to create the public space for that we need to take away the room for the cars we need to be able to make this private space a public space for everyone to live in and so i think we need to be ambitious we need to be able to inform our citizens have discussions empower them to be able to make the right decisions and have their voice be heard every voice be heard i want to see more young people i want to see more women participating in politics more people of color and i think um that w one of these crucial things is and th it was mentioned in the beginning often politicians and governments do think in in election periods but i think we we as citizens and as people that are in governments we need to push to think and make politics that are that go beyond the election period because if we don't then we will continue thinking in a, in a short period of time and we will not be able to really actually tackle tackle and not solve, but actually tackle the issues that we have and that we need to be able to deal with as the people responsible for many citizens. So I'm, I'm actually quite positive that we can do it, but we actually need to get going to and not just talk about it. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, good to end on a positive, upbeat note. Um, I was going to uh, ask some fundamental questions at the end, because um, I'm not quite sure whether I'm that positive, given the scale of the, the challenge we're facing, but also given the trade-offs which are there between different objectives. Um, but uh, as we have said, uh, this is a challenge which we will have to address. Uh, it is not a choice. It is the way the world is changing, um, and that is something we will have to deal with. Um, so I'm very glad to see that uh, certainly one thing which does uh, which has changed over time is the recognition that this is something which has to be done and that it will require action at all levels, including at the city level. 
Um, and uh, in that sense, I think uh, we are on the right way, even though there's still a long way to go. Um, so thank you very much um, to the panelists uh, for this discussion, to the audience, and also to the organizers. As I said, it's very good uh, to have this discussion here in Budapest, and I hope we will continue it at a time in the near future. Thank you. Thank you.